Oh, let me go down the list of some of these that I came up with. We've, we've got DARPA has the sonic projector that was recorded on in 2007. Of course, it had been around for quite some time before then. Army has something they call voice to skull. We've got the Air Force using microwaves to create sounds at Brooks Air Force Base. We've got the Marine Corps with their Medusa project. We've got the State Department, as reported by the Washington Post in 2005, working on voices implanted in people's heads. We've got a couple of companies, one that has patented something called Hypersound. That's American Technologies. It's also got Holosonic Research Labs, also has a patented version. So the military-industrial complex has been all over this. When you see something this wide, this is not just one little research project from one organization. And this is something that five, ten years ago, it was being reported on in even mainstream press like the Washington Post, and yet nobody knows about this. It's Wednesday, March 30th, 4.59 p.m. I'm going to read Chapter 18 of Part 3 of Book 4, Of Clairvoyance and of the Body of Light, Its Powers and Its Development, Also Concerning Divination. 1. Within the human body is another body of approximately the same size and shape, but made of a subtler and less illusory material, i.e., as a general rule, it can, of course, be altered very greatly in these respects. It is, of course, not real, but then no more is the other body. Before treating of clairvoyance, one must discuss briefly this question of reality, for misapprehension on the subject has given rise to endless trouble. There is the story of the American in the train who saw another American carrying a basket of unusual shape. His curiosity mastered him, and he leant across and said, Say, stranger, what you got in the bag? The other, lantern-jawed and taciturn, replied, Mongoose. The first man was rather baffled, as he had never heard of a mongoose. After a pause, he pursued, at the risk of a rebuff. But say, what is a mongoose? Mongoose eats snakes, replied the other. This was another poser, but he pursued. What in the hell do you want a mongoose for? Well, you see, said the second man in a confidential whisper, my brother sees snakes. The first man was more puzzled than ever. But, after a long think, he continued rather pathetically. But say, them ain't real snakes. Sure, said the man with the basket, but this mongoose ain't real either. This is a perfect parable of magic. There is no such thing as truth in the perceptible universe. Every idea, when analyzed, is found to contain a contradiction. It is quite useless, except as a temporary expedient, to set up one class of ideas against another as being more real. The advance of man towards God is not necessarily an advance towards truth. All philosophical systems have crumbled, but each class of ideas possesses true relations within itself. It is possible, with Berkeley, to deny the existence of water and of wood, but for all that, wood floats on water. The real Berkeley did nothing of the sort. The reference here is to an imaginary animal invented by Dr. Johnson out of sturdy British ignorance. The magician becomes identical with the immortal Osiris, yet the magician dies. In this dilemma, the facts must be restated. One should preferably say that the magician becomes conscious of that part of himself which he calls the immortal Osiris, and that part does not die. Now this interior body of the magician of which we spoke at the beginning of this chapter does exist, and can exert certain powers which his natural body cannot do. It can, for example, pass through matter, and it can move freely in every direction through space. But this is because matter, in the sense in which we commonly use the word, is on another plane. We do not call electrical resistance or economical laws unreal on the ground that they are not directly perceived by the senses. Our magical doctrine is universally accepted by skeptics, only they wish to make magic itself an exception. Now this fine body perceives a universe which we do not ordinarily perceive. It does not necessarily perceive the universe which we do normally perceive, so that although in this body I can pass through the roof, it does not follow that I shall be able to tell what the weather is like. I might do so or I might not, but if I could not, it would not prove that I was deceiving myself in supposing that I had passed through the roof. This body, which is called by various authors the astral double, body of light, body of fire, body of desire, fine body, sin, leka, and numberless other names, is naturally fitted to perceive objects on its own class, in particular the phantoms of the astral plane. See also Notes for an Astral Atlas. There is some sort of vague and indeterminate relation between the astrals and the materials, and it is possible with great experience to deduce facts about material things from the astral aspect which they present to the eyes of the body of light. This is because there is a certain necessary correspondence between planes, as in the case of an Anglo-Indian's liver and his temper. 
The relation appears vague and indeterminate only in so far as one happens to be ignorant of the laws which state the case. The situation is analogous to that of the scientist before the discovery of the law of combining weights, etc. This astral plane is so varied and so changeable that several clairvoyants looking at the same thing might give totally different accounts of what they saw, yet they might each make correct deductions. In looking at a man, the clairvoyant might say, the lines of force are all drooping. The second, it seems all dirty and spotty. A third, the aura looks very ragged. Yet all might agree in deducing that the man was in ill health. In any case, all such deductions are really unreliable. One must be a highly skilled man before one can trust one's vision. A great many people think that they are extremely good at the business, when in fact they have only made some occasional shrewd guesses, which they naturally remember in the course of hundreds of forgotten failures. The only way to test clairvoyance is to keep a careful record of every experiment made. For example, Frater O.M. once gave a clairvoyant a waistcoat to psychometrize. He made 56 statements about the owner of the waistcoat. Of these, four were notably right, 17, though correct, were of that class of statement which is true of almost everybody. The remainder were wrong. It was concluded from this that he showed no evidence of any special power. In fact, his bodily eyes, if he could discern tailoring, would have served him better, for he thought the owner of the vest was a corn chandler instead of an earl as he is. The magician can hardly take too much trouble to develop this power in himself. It is extremely useful to him in guarding himself against attacks, in obtaining warnings, in judging character, and especially in watching the progress of his ceremonies. There are a great many ways of acquiring the power. Gaze into a crystal, or into a pool of ink in the palm of the hand, or into a mirror, or into a teacup. Just as, with a microscope, the expert operator keeps both eyes open, though seen only through the one at the eyepiece of the instrument. So the natural eyes, ceasing to give any message to the brain, the attention is withdrawn from them, and the man begins to see through the astral eyes. These methods appear to the master Therion to be unsatisfactory. Very often they do not work at all. It is difficult to teach a person to use these symbols, and at worst of all, they are purely passive. You can only see what is shown you, and you are probably shown things perfectly pointless and irrelevant. The proper method is as follows. Develop the body of light until it is just as real to you as your other body. Teach it to travel to any desired symbol, and enable it to perform all necessary rites and invocations. In short, educate it. Ultimately, the relation of that body with your own must be exceedingly intimate. But before this harmonizing takes place, you should begin by careful differentiation. The first thing to do, therefore, is to get the body outside your own. You must avoid muddling the two. You begin by imagining a shape resembling yourself standing in front of you. Do not say, oh, it's only imagination. The time to test that is later on, when you have secured a fairly clear mental image of such a body. Try to imagine how your own body would look if you were standing in its place. Try to transfer your consciousness to the body of light. Your own body has its eyes shut. Use the eyes of the body of light to describe the objects in the room behind you. Don't say it's only an effort of subconscious memory. The time to test that is later on. As soon as you feel more or less at home in the fine body, let it rise in the air. Keep on feeling the sense of rising. Keep on looking about you as you rise until you see a landscape of beings of the astral plane. Such have a quality all their own. They are not like material things, they are not like mental pictures. They seem to lie between the two. After some practice has made you adept, so that in the course of an hour's journey you can reckon on having a fairly eventful time, turn your attention to reaching a definite place on the astral plane. Invoke Mercury, for example, and examine carefully your record of the resulting vision. Discover whether the symbols which you have seen correspond with the conventional symbols of Mercury. This testing of the spirits is the most important branch of the whole tree of magic. Without it, one is lost in the jungle of delusion. Every spirit up to God himself is ready to deceive you if possible, to make himself out more important than he is, in short, to lay in wait for your soul in 333 separate ways. Remember that after all, the highest of all the gods is only the magus, Mayan, the greatest of all the devils. You may also try rising on the plains. With a little practice, especially if you have a good guru, you ought to be able to slip in and out of your astral body as easily as you slip in and out of a dressing gown. It will then no longer be so necessary for your astral body to be sent far off. Without moving an inch, you will be able to turn on its eyes and ears, if simply as the man with the microscope mentioned above 
can transfer his complete attention from one eye to the other. Now, however unsuccessful your getting out of the body may apparently have been, it is most necessary to use every effort to bring it back properly. Make the body of light coincide in space with the physical body. Assume the God form and vibrate the name of Harpocrates with the utmost energy, then recover unity of consciousness. If you fail to do this properly, you may find yourself in serious trouble. Your body of light may wander away uncontrolled and be attacked and obsessed. You will become aware of this through the occurrence of headache, bad dreams, or even more serious signs such as hysteria, fainting fits, possibly madness, or paralysis. Even the worst of these attacks will probably wear off, but it may leave you permanently damaged to a greater or lesser extent. A great majority of spiritualists, occultists, tashasophists are pitiable examples of repeated losses from this cause. The emotional type of religionist also suffers in this way. Devotion projects the fine body, which is seized and vampirized by the demon masquerading as Christ, or Mary, or whoever may be the object of worship. Complete absence of all power to concentrate thought, to follow an argument, to formulate a will, to hold fast to an opinion or a course of action, or even to keep a solemn oath, mark indelibly those who have thus lost parts of their souls. They wander from one new cult to another, even crazier. Occasionally, such persons drift for a moment into the surroundings of the Master Therion, and are shot out by the simple process of making them try to do a half-hour's honest work of any kind. In projecting the astral, it is a valuable additional safeguard to perform the whole operation in a properly consecrated circle. Proceed with great caution, then, but proceed. In time, your body of light will be as strong against spirits as your other body against the winds of heaven. All depends upon the development of that body of light. It must be furnished with an organism as ramified and balanced as its shadowy brother, the material body. To recapitulate once more, then, the first task is to develop your own body of light within your own circle, without reference to any other inhabitants of the world to which it belongs. That which you have accomplished with the subject you may now proceed to do with the object. You will learn to see with your astral eyes the astral appearance of material things. And although this does not properly belong to pure clairvoyance, one may here again mention that, that you should endeavor to the utmost to develop and fortify this body of light. The best and simplest way to do this is to use it constantly, to exercise it in every way. In particular, it may be employed in ceremonies of initiation or of invocation while the physical body remains silent and still. In doing this, it will often be necessary to create a temple on the astral plane. It is excellent practice to create symbols. This one precaution is needed. After using them, they should be reabsorbed. Having learned to create astral forms, the next step is to influence forms already existing, and this will be at first very difficult. Phantasmal and fleeting as the astral is in general, those forms which are definitely attached to the material possess enormous powers of resistance, and it consequently requires very high potential to influence them. Their material analogs seem to serve as a fortress. Even where a temporary effect is produced, the inertia of matter draws it back to the normal. Yet the power of the trained and consecrated will in a well-developed astral body is such that it can even produce a permanent change in the material upon whose body of light you are working. E.g., one can heal the sick by restoring a healthy appearance to their astral forms. On the other hand, it is possible so to disintegrate the body of light even of a strong man that he will fall dead. Such operations demand not only power but judgment. Nothing can upset the sum total of destiny. Everything must be paid for for the uttermost farthing. For this reason, a great many operations theoretically possible cannot be performed. Suppose, for example, you see two men of similarly unhealthy astral appearance. In one case, the cause might be slight and temporary. Your help suffices to restore him in a few minutes. The other, who looks no worse, is really oppressed by a force incalculably greater than you could control, and you would only damage yourself by attempting to help him. The diagnosis between the two cases could be made by an investigation of the deeper strata of the astral, such as compose the causal body. A body of black magicians under Anna Kingsford once attempted to kill a vivisector who was not particularly well known, and they succeeded in making him seriously ill. Anna Kingsford, so far as her good work is concerned, was only the rubber stamp of Edward Maitland. But in attempting the same thing with Pasteur, they produced no effect whatsoever, because Pasteur was a great genius, 
an adept in his own line far greater than she in hers, and because millions of people were daily blessing him. It cannot be too clearly understood that magical force is subject to the same laws of proportion as any other kind of force. It is useless for a mere millionaire to try to bankrupt a man who has the Bank of England behind him. To sum up, the first task is to separate the astral form from the physical body. The second, to develop the powers of the astral body, in particular those of sight, travel, and interpretation. Third, to unify the two bodies without muddling them. This being accomplished, the magician is fitted to deal with the invisible. Two, it is now useful to continue with considerations of other planes, which have commonly been classed under the astral. There is some reason for this, as the delimitations are somewhat vague. Just as the vegetable kingdom merges into the animal, and as the material plane has beings which encroach upon the boundaries of the astral, so do we find it in the higher planes. The mental images which appear during meditation are subjective, and pertain not at all to the astral plane. Only very rarely do astral images occur during meditation. It is a bad break in the circle as a rule when they do. There is also a magical plane. This touches the material and even includes a portion of it. It includes the astral, chiefly a full-blooded type of the astral. It reaches to and includes most, if not all, of the spiritual planes. The magical plane is thus the most comprehensive of all. Egyptian gods are typical inhabitants of this plane and it is the home of every adept. The spiritual planes are of several types, but are all distinguished by a reality and intensity to be found nowhere else. Their inhabitants are formless, free of space and time, and distinguished by incomparable brilliance. There are also a number of subplanes, as for example the alchemical. This plane will often appear in the practice of rising on the plains. Its images are usually those of gardens curiously kept, mountains furnished with peculiar symbols, hieroglyphic animals, or such figures as that of the Hermetic Arcanum, and pictures like the Gold Seekers and the Massacre of the Innocents of Basil Valentine. There is also a unique quality about the alchemical plane which renders its images immediately recognizable. There are also planes corresponding to various religions past and present, all of which have their peculiar unity. It is of the utmost importance to the clairvoyant or traveler in the fine body to be able to find his way to any desired place, and operate therein as its ruler. The neophyte of AA is examined most strictly in this practice before he is passed to the degree of zealotor. In the rising on the plains one must usually pass clear through the astral, a long way for some people to the spiritual. Some will be unable to do this. The fine body which is good enough to subsist on lower planes, a shadow among shadows, will fail to penetrate the higher strata. It requires a great development of this body, and an intense infusion of the highest spiritual constituents of man, before he can pierce the veils. The constant practice of magic is the best preparation possible. Even though the human consciousness fails to reach the goal, the consciousness of the fine body itself may do so. Wherefore, whoso travels in that body on a subsequent occasion may be found worthy, and its success will again react favorably on the human consciousness, and increase its likelihood of success in its next magical operation. Similarly, the powers gained in this way will strengthen the magician in his meditation practices. His will becomes better able to assist the concentration, to destroy the mental images which disturb it, and to reject the lesser rewards of that practice which tempt and too often stop the progress of the mystic. Although it is said that the spiritual lies beyond the astral, this is theoretical. The advanced magician will not find it to be so in practice. The Honorable Bertrand Russell's Principia Mathematica may be said to lie beyond Colenso's School Arithmetic, but one can take the former book from one's shelves, as everyone should, and read it without first going all through the latter again. He will be able, by suitable invocation, to travel directly to any place desired. In Liber 418, an example of perfection is given. The adept who explored these ethers did not have to pass through and beyond the universe, the whole of which yet lies within even the inmost thirtieth ether. He was able to summon the ethers he wanted, and his chief difficulty was that sometimes he was at first unable to pierce their veils. In fact, as the book shows, it was only by virtue of successive and most exalted initiations undergone in the ethers themselves that he was able to penetrate beyond the fifteenth. The guardians of such fortresses know how to guard. The Master Theorion has published the most important practical magical secrets in the plainest language. 
No one, by virtue of being clever or learned, has understood one word, and those unworthy to have profaned the sacrament have but eaten and drunk in damnation to themselves. One may bring down stolen fire in a hollow tube from heaven, as the Master Therion indeed has done, in a way that no other adept dared to do before him, but the thief, the titan, must foreknow and consent to his doom, to be chained upon a lonely rock, the vulture devouring his liver for a season, until Hercules, the strong man armed by virtue of that very fire, shall come and release him. The titan, whose number is a number of a man, six hundred and three score and six, unsubdued, consoled by Asia and Panthea, must send forth constant showers of blessing, not only upon man whose incarnation he is, but upon the tyrant and the persecutor. His infinite pain must thrill his heart with joy, since every pang is but the echo of some new flame that leaps upon the earth lit by his crime. For the gods are the enemies of man. It is nature that man must overcome ere he enter into his kingdom. In another sense, a higher sense, nature is absolutely right throughout. The position is that the magician discovers himself imprisoned in a distorted nature of iniquity, and his task is to disentangle it. This is all to be studied in the Book of Wisdom or Folly, Liber Aleph 111, and in the Master Therion's edition of the Tao Te Ching. A rough note from his magical diary is appended here. All elements must at one time have been separate. That would be the case with great heat. Now, when atoms get to the sun, we get that immense extreme heat, and all the elements are themselves again. Imagine that each atom of each element possesses the memory of all his adventures in combination. By the way, that atom fortified with that memory would not be the same atom, yet it is, because it has gained nothing from anywhere except this memory. Therefore, by the lapse of time and by virtue of memory, a thing could become something more than itself, and thus a real development is possible. One can then see a reason for any element deciding to go through this series of incarnations, because so, and only so, can he go, and he suffers the lapse of memory which he has during these incarnations, because he knows he will come through unchanged. Therefore, you can have an infinite number of gods, individual and equal, though diverse, each one supreme and utterly indestructible. This is also the only explanation of how a being could create a world in which war, evil, etc. exist. Evil is only an appearance, because, like good, it cannot affect the substance itself, but only multiply its combinations. This is something the same as mystic monotheism, but the objection to that theory is that God has to create things which are all parts of himself, so that the interplay is false. If we presuppose many elements, their interplay is natural. It is no objection to this theory to ask who made the elements. The elements are at least there, and God, when you look for him, is not there. Theism is obscurum pur obscurius, Latin explaining the obscure by the more obscure. A male star is built up from the center outwards a female from the circumference inwards. This is what is meant when we say that woman has no soul. It explains fully the difference between the sexes. The true God is man, in man are all things hidden. Of these, the gods, nature, time, all the powers of the universe are rebellious slaves. It is these that men must fight and conquer in the power and in the name of the beast, that hath availed them the titan, the magus, the man, whose number is six hundred and three score and six. 3. The practice of rising on the plains is of such importance that special attention must be paid to it. It is part of the essential technique of magic. Instruction in this practice has been given with such superb conciseness in Liber O that one cannot do better than quote verbatim. 1. The previous experiment has little value and leads to few results of importance. The previous experiment referred to in the first sentence is the ordinary astral journey but it is susceptible of the development which merges into a form of dharana concentration and as such may lead to the very highest ends. The principal use of the practice in the last chapter is to familiarize the student with every kind of obstacle and every kind of delusion, so that he may be perfect master of every idea that may arise in his brain, to dismiss it, to transmute it, to cause it instantly to obey his will. 2. Let him begin exactly as before, but with the most intense solemnity and determination. 3. Let him be very careful to cause his imaginary body to rise in a line exactly perpendicular to the Earth's tangent at the point where his physical body is situated, or, to put it more simply, straight upwards. 4. Instead of stopping, let him continue to rise until fatigue almost overcomes him. If he should find that he is stopped without willing to do so, and that figures appear, let him at all cost rise above them. Yet though his very life tremble on his lips, let him force his way upward and onward. 
Let him continue in this so long as the breath of life is in him. Whatever threatens, whatever allures, though it were Typhon and all his hosts loose from the pit and leads against him, though it were from the very throne of God himself that a voice issues bidding him stay and be content, let him struggle on ever on. 6. At last there must come a moment when his whole being is swallowed up in fatigue, overwhelmed by its own inertia. Let him sink when no longer can he strive, though his tongue be bitten through with the effort and blood gush from his own nostrils, into the blackness of unconsciousness, and then, on coming to himself, let him write down soberly and accurately a record of all that hath occurred. Yeah, a record of all that hath occurred. Of course, the rising may be done from any starting point. One can go, for example, into the circle of Jupiter, and the results, especially in the lower planes, will be very different to those obtained from a Saturnian starting point. The student should undertake a regular series of such experiments, in order to familiarize himself not only with the nature of those different spheres, but with the inner meaning of each. Of course, it is not necessary in every case to push the practice to exhaustion, as described in the instructions, but this is the proper thing to do whenever definitely practicing, in order to acquire the power of rising. But having obtained this power, it is, of course, legitimate to rise to any particular plane that may be necessary for the purpose of exploration, as in the case of the visions recorded in Liber 418, where the method may be described as mixed. In such a case, it is not enough to invoke the place you wish to visit because you may not be able to endure its pressure or to breathe its atmosphere. Several instances occur in that record where the seer was unable to pass through certain gateways or to remain in certain contemplations. He had to undergo certain initiations before he was able to proceed. Thus, it is necessary that the technique of magic should be perfected. The body of light must be rendered capable of going everywhere and doing everything. It is, therefore, always the question of drill which is of importance. You have got to go out rising on the plains every day of your life, year after year. You are not to be disheartened by failure or too much encouraged by success in any one practice or set of practices. What you are doing is what will be of real value to you in the end, and that is developing a character, creating a karma which will give you the power to do your will.